All right, so we are on our final um, like kind of distinction between memory systems. And uh, this would be the distinction between implicit and explicit memory. So implicit memory includes the procedural memory system. Um, so I told you earlier, you know, I, I kind of blew past the procedural memory. Um, but implicit memory includes these kinds of, um, you know, like behavioral things, how to walk and chew gum, how to draw, um, these kinds of procedures that you can do, usually physical procedures, uh, but it also could be sort of orders of operation that you actually would think about. Um, you might have in your implicit memory store um, the multiplication tables. If you were a little kid and they were drilled into you as a multiplication table, you might have those as part of your implicit memory store. Um, little adages like I before E except after C. Little things like that might be part of your implicit memory store. It's a bottom-up process typically where certain kinds of information comes in and without even thinking about it certain kinds of procedures go out. So um, I'll give you a dumb example. So you hear somebody knock, and I don't think you'll be able to hear my knocking on a microphone, but um, so you hear dun, 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 dun. And it's really hard not to do two knocks back, right? Dun, dun. <laughs> um, that kind of bottom-up processing, you don't even have to think about it. Your body just wants to respond with two knocks. Um, shave and a haircut, six bits, two bits, four bits. I don't know how much a shave and a haircut costs when they made up that song. Um, bottom up, it doesn't necessarily need you to consciously process anything. Um, you don't have any sense of conscious recollection with an implicit process. It's something that your body just responds with or maybe your brain just responds with. Um, with implicit memories, we typically are going to have to infer that a memory underlies that response, right? It's indirectly reflected. Um, so we assume that you must know it because look what you just did right? You, it must be in your memory store. Um, so we can do indirect memory tests to establish whether memory was invoked. Like we might give you a le lexical decision task. Is queem a word, right? And so um, very automatically without a lot of conscious reflection, you're going to be able to say no to the, you know, to that question. Is queem a word? No. You could do a word comple completion task. And again, this happens with very little thought. And so here we have C L A blank, and you can complete it with whatever you want to. And typically, whatever you choose to respond first and foremost is probably sort of your most procedural, encoded, thoughtless response. The first thing, it might be because you just recently heard something. We oftentimes will prime people. Um, so maybe half of the participants, we prime them to think about a day out digging clams. And the other half of people, we say, um, you know, the person was in a math class. And then we give them a word completion task. And oddly, um, the people who heard about clams are primed and more likely to complete that as clams. And the people who are primed to think about a class are more likely to fill that as class, right? So we can kind of get at whatever is currently in your sort of unconscious consciousness. Um, again, with the illusion of truth, though, with those familiar claims, right? Implicit memory is probably underlying that illusion of truth, that we have heard it more than once. We've heard it maybe repeatedly. We start to believe, or we've seen it. It doesn't always have to be, you know, auditory. It could be visual. Um, we start to think that it's probably true. And it's probably an implicit process. So that's why it's super important to be aware that this is a process and then take steps to avoid it, right? If, if you've heard it multiple times, it's time to actually start going, hmm, instead of believing it, what if I do a little bit more legwork to figure out whether what I'm hearing is true or not? Right? Just because it's been repeated a lot doesn't mean it's true. But because it's an implicit response, you have to consciously override your tendency to go, hmm, this is completely unconscious. This is the 10th time I've heard this. I'm starting to buy it. That's happening in an unconscious level. Um, so it's a really tricky thing to override. Now, explicit memory would be the kind of memory that benefits from like elaboration or from organizational strategies. Like these are things that you do on purpose, right? It's a top-down process where you take what you already know and process the information through that lens. 
um, you have a sensation of conscious recollection whenever you're talking about explicit memories because these are things that you know you know. Um, implicit memories are things that you don't know you know. A lot of times implicit memory only reveals itself with the proper context. Um, with explicit memory, you know you know it. And it's really super frustrating when you know you know it, but you can't think of what the answer is. Right? You're like, oh man, I know, I know this. Why can't I? I know, I know this. Hold on, give me a second. Right? Like with explicit memory, you have that sensation sometimes. Um, with explicit memory tests, we are directly measuring memory, right? Like this is directly mem um, reflecting the memory system. Whereas with implicit, it's something that we would have to infer. Um, so we can measure your explicit memory system with, you know, recall tests or recognition tests or, you know, rapid relearning, something like that. And so your explicit memory system um, would would consist of all those things that you are aware that you know. So the last thing I wanted to say about all of this is can there be explicit memory without implicit memory? So what we have is um, control group college students. Then we have patient, patient SM046 who had damage to the amygdala and then patient WC1606 who had damage to the hippocampus, which I think we've established that the hippocampus clearly has something to do with you know, long-term effortful memory and the amygdala is the part that adds in emotion, right? And so what we see is that um, in an implicit memory test, we're going to measure the fear response by collecting galvanic skin response. Like is there, are their hands sweating, things like that. And then with the explicit memory, we're going to ask them, do you remember that? And what you see is in the fear response, the controls and WC1606, they're responding the same way. They're having the same fear response to that stimulation as um, each other. In the explicit memory test, SM046 is responding the same as the controls and WC1606 is not. So what we're seeing is different, different systems, right? Damage to the amygdala, we're having trouble with the emotions. Damage to the hippocampus, we're having trouble with the long-term memory. Um, so you can have explicit memory without having any, you know, sort of emotional valence or any, um, you know, implicit response to that stimulation. And you can have emotional response and, and not have any explicit memory. Those are separate systems. So kind of an interesting new twist on some of these things. All right, well, I think that completes this chapter and we will pick up with um, the knowledge base in the next segment. All right, see you later.